I've been looking to upgrade my 2018 MacBook Pro ever since I became a content creator earlier this year. I think, hopefully, I think I may have found my perfect solution, the new Mac Mini. I film my YouTube videos in 4K and I do quite a lot of editing in Final Cut before uploading to YouTube. So my laptop struggles quite a bit. I'm hoping that the new Apple M1 chips in the Mac Minis that have just been released will help speed up my workflow so I'm not waiting around for Final Cut to finish processing and rendering before I can do anything else, while my computer growls at me angrily and I'm in fear of breaking the whole system. If you're after a technical review, this video probably isn't for you. But if you want to see me try out my full content creation process using Final Cut, Lightroom, Photoshop and a few other apps, or if you're considering getting a Mac Mini yourself and you want to know what to expect or which model to go for, stick around. I went for the base model Mac Mini, which at $699 gives you 256 gigabytes of storage and eight gigabytes of RAM. These numbers are scarily low and I was pretty anxious about whether it will be able to handle my content creation process. For reference, my MacBook Pro that I'm using has 512 gigabytes of storage and 16 gigabytes of RAM, double the Mac Mini, hence why I'm anxious. So let's talk about storage. I have 140 gigabytes of storage left available after installing my apps. My raw footage plus Final Cut project files for one video uses up about 100 gigabytes, so this clearly isn't going to be enough to store them on. But I'm going to store all of my files on our NAS instead, which has loads of space. You can buy a Mac Mini with two terabytes of storage, but that would cost an extra $800, which I don't want to pay. Using something external is much cheaper. Editing videos in Final Cut Pro is one of the major parts of my workflow and causes me the most grief on my current MacBook Pro. So that's the first thing I wanted to test, editing a video in Final Cut Pro. So I tried doing what I always do when creating a new video, starting with setting up a new library and a new project for the video. Usually when importing my files in, I create proxy and optimize media to speed up my editing process, but it usually takes an hour or two to transcode the media. So for this test, I'm gonna leave those unticked and see how fast I can edit without optimized media. Importing the video and audio files in from my external Samsung drive was super quick. The files appeared in here instantly. I dumped it all into my timeline and did my first round of edits muting the audio on all the clips, rotating them all and speeding them up. Usually this causes my MacBook Pro to get very angry and overheated and I would have to go and make a cup of tea while Final Cut renders and catches up before I can watch any of the footage clearly. I was able to go to the parts of the timeline that I wanted to go to without the playhead jumping around and there wasn't a single bit of noise from the Mac Mini. Usually I can't even hear the music I'm playing from Spotify while I'm editing because my MacBook is growling so loudly. Next I added my B-roll to the timeline and applied stabilization to all of it. The clips were stabilized in less than two minutes. Usually I have to wait a while to see my stabilized footage, but this was done almost immediately. I was even able to apply some transitions to the clips without it causing any disruption. I added a cross dissolve to the intro and outro clips and a slide to another. It was a bit jumpy when playing it back, but I was still able to click on the clip and see the slide transition. Usually I wouldn't be able to do that and would have to go and do something else before testing the transition. Next, I dragged and dropped a snow generator to the timeline, which I would fully expect to create a load of noise and potentially freeze everything in Final Cut. It was definitely jumpy when playing it back immediately, but I was able to see the snow generator and go to specific points in the timeline and carry on editing. I'm not usually able to do that and I'd be going to make another cup of tea while waiting for it to catch up. I then opened up another project in Final Cut called Assets and this is where I go to copy and paste my intro title, my subscribe and Instagram buttons and my end screen. 
There was no disruption at all and I was able to drop them in and carry on editing. At this point, I add my voiceover and I add music. Cropping the voiceover in specific places was fine. Often when I try to use the blade in specific parts of the voiceover, while so many other things are happening in Final Cut, I can't easily get to those points because the playhead jumps around when I try. No problems here whatsoever. Finally, I export it to Masterfile to save it on my drive. At this point, I also want to open up my Lightroom to edit the thumbnail for the video, which usually makes my MacBook Pro very angry. I often have to come back after the video is exported to edit the photo. On the Mac Mini, editing the photo in Lightroom while the video was exporting was fine, and I was even able to add more pressure to it by opening Photoshop and editing it some more. Back in Lightroom, my new photo with the edits from Photoshop appeared immediately, and I was able to instantly export the thumbnail to my Mac. I heard that the Adobe products aren't optimised for the new Macs yet, but as you can see, in my experience so far, I haven't had any issues with them. Back in Final Cut, my video was still exporting. It ended up taking a total of 12 minutes for the video to export, and this was with background rendering turned off. So you'd expect it to take a lot longer since none of it was already rendered. I'm not sure how this Apple Silicon stuff works, but it's definitely helping me out here. I've also tested other apps that I use in the content creation process, like Notion. This is where I have my content planner set up and where I store all of my research and write up my scripts and plans. This worked completely fine with no issues. The same with Bear, another one of my note-taking apps, and GarageBand where I record my audio for videos. A huge benefit of the Mac Mini again is that there was no noise when I was recording my voiceovers in GarageBand, even though I had a browser with multiple tabs open and a number of other apps open. At the end of each week, I write my weekly newsletter in Flowdesk, which I access via Google Chrome. I had some major issues here and found that Chrome kept on crashing while I was trying to design my newsletter and I lost my edits several times. I then re-downloaded Chrome and selected the Apple M1 version of Chrome, which then improved the performance. I haven't had any issues with Chrome since, but I'm still slightly nervous about the stability of it. Which leads me to some key considerations if you're thinking of moving away from an Intel-based Mac, which is basically all of the Apple products before November when they introduced Apple Silicon. The first consideration is, are you happy to be an early adopter of this new technology? Some apps aren't ready yet for Apple Silicon and some aren't optimized. So look into what apps you need to use and whether they are optimized for Apple Silicon. Second, there are only two USB-A ports, two Thunderbolt ports and one HDMI port in the Mac Mini. Think about how many ports you need before buying this. I'm using up all of the ports and need an extra dongle for some more USB-A ports. And finally, if you're moving away from a laptop, do you already have a monitor, a webcam, a keyboard, a mouse? Because if you don't, they're gonna be an extra cost too. From my perspective, my MacBook Pro cost me 2,300 pounds and the Mac Mini cost 699 pounds. Selling my MacBook Pro will cover the cost of the Mac Mini and I get to have a powerful computer that speeds up my content creation process. I hope you found this useful and let me know in the comments if you wanna see more content like this. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.